Welcome back, everybody. This is episode three of The Pro Show. I'm your host, Thomas Crow, and with me today is my vested partner, Brian Powers. We've gotten many comments on this vest today. Uh, and notice I didn't say compliments. I've gotten comments. Yeah. Apparently, I don't know what to wear with it. So Fair enough. <clears throat> that's unfortunate. With us today, we have a special guest. We have a legend in the state of Indiana, I would say. Uh, wow. We have legend. we a legend. We have Franklin or Franklin College graduate, and we have Indianapolis uh, Channel Six reporter Rafael Sanchez. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah I'm I, kind of the I'm part of the Franklin uh, Community High School family. My my daughter graduated from there. My son graduated from there. So I I sat through many uh, a basketball and football game in those comfortable bleachers throughout the sporting facility. So I'm a, I'm a proud Cub parent. Well, you yeah, also, parent. you did our uh, our um, opening ceremonies to the school year in 2019, 2020. Uh, this is, uh, he, all the teachers come in at the beginning of the year and Rafael was the, the MC. Um, he had several outfit changes. <laughs> it was, it was actually quite hilarious. I will say, uh, that since you opened up the 1920 school year, and we all know how that year ended, I would like for you right. to never come back again <laughs> and do that. Fair enough. You know, I was scheduled to come back in 20, but obviously, thanks to you and, and your start of the pandemic, <laughs> then I, I'm stuck in my living room, which is where you're at right now. So welcome to my living room. I have been trapped here in this little room in my house since uh, March the 28th. So. They actually put a television studio in my house. There are these two cameras. I feel like one of those pizzas at, at the Speedway gas station. <laughs> I'm always just burning up. Uh, but they keep me nice and, and warm during the winter months. So here we are, hopefully for a better 2021, right? Yeah, absolutely. Casa de Sanchez with the two cameras. That's a, that's a way to roll. So, um, you know, we just wanted to start off, just give us a little bit of a rundown of, uh, if you're willing, of your kind of how you got into broadcasting, how you got to Franklin College. I know you kind of have a little interesting story of how you got there. Yeah, so listen, I'm from the Bronx, the BX, uh, New York City, and uh, just I came to Franklin College just uh, down the road from the high school, and I triple majored there. And then I thought, you know what? I like to talk. I want to get paid to, to talk, and I love to talk, and uh, I got a job. Uh, I interned. At Channel 8, when I was in college at Franklin, I interned um, at what was then Channel 4, uh, which is now Channel, which is now the CBS station. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first job was in Yuma, Arizona, sight unseen. Um, I left my Dairy Queen job, the Dairy Queen there on US 31. That was me. I made your ice cream cones. And I headed out to Yuma, where the temperature on July the 14th, when I landed, was 100 and. 18 degrees <laughs> it was in fact the postcards say welcome to yuma hotter than hell and it is so true <laughs> um but that's how i started my career so my first job was in yuma arizona uh and it was just hot guys it was i, I don't even know what to tell you um it was so hot that we had to wear on the job polo shirts and shorts were required and you had to walk around with a water bottle because it would get so hot that the Salt deposits would build up on the sides of your mouth, and everywhere you walked, you thought, "Dang, what's? Did I eat a jelly donut? What happened?" <laughs> but it was the salt that would just gather there uh. on the corners of your mouth. It was kind of gross, but uh, I was also like my thinnest. Like you would walk out, and you would lose like two pounds <laughs> just by walking outside. Uh, so um, Arizona is beautiful. You ever been to Arizona? Beautiful mountains. Yeah, um, it is very nice. But it's like it's, it's like a. a sweat farm oh yeah I mean, it heats up and, real quick too yeah and i've always been kind of a chubby chunky little guy and so i was loving it i was like hey look at me i'm looking good <laughs> yeah, Arizona. you would want to lose the to long sleeve yeah. yeah came back to indiana had me some tenderloins some lemon shake-ups and the weight came back <laughs> <laughs> so when you're out there in, in arizona do you remember like the first story you did well, I have to tell you that as a New Yorker, I had never learned to drive. So I learned to drive two weeks before I got on my plane. So while I was in Indiana the whole time in college, uh, I had people driving me around to Walmart, at the Taco Bell, 
and, and all my dates, the girlfriend would drive me. So I knew Uber before Uber was created. And um, so I learned to drive. And, dude, I was the worst driver in America. <laughs> I, I, I racked up five speeding tickets. I didn't know... I didn't know what a red light was. I didn't know what a green light was. I, I was horrible. So my apologies to every person who lives in the Grand Canyon state. If I drove you off the road, if I caused you any hurt, injuries, I apologize because I was just terrible. So that was my first experience. I had to drive in a company vehicle and I had just learned to drive in Indiana oh. two weeks prior. We're gonna have to do that was, a, that was a hot mess right there. Yeah. We're, we're gonna have to do Man. an investigative report on uh, Rafael Sanchez's previous yeah. driving yeah. history. Yeah, Man, I was bad. I was really bad. So you come back like, to Franklin? Or, go ahead. Well, like the government should have never given me a driver's license. <laughs> I should have never been allowed to drive anywhere in the United States of America when I was in, in Arizona. Because I mean, guys. I was bad. Well, you picked like you picked the right career because you've got a camera camera guy with you a lot of times, and so they would probably you'd just be like, "Yeah, hey, you can go ahead and drive. I got to get this stuff situated and get my stand up yeah. ready and things." That first job, I was the camera guy. I was the camera guy, the reporter, the editor, and the producer. It's called <laughs> a multimedia journalist. Now we call them MMJs. So back in the day when it was not um, appropriate, we would call it a one man band, obviously, that's gender inappropriate these days. So I was a one man band, and so I did it all. And so, no, I, I couldn't ask anyone else to drive me. I was the driver. Man, my apologies again to all those people <laughs> in Arizona. We've come a long way since then, gentlemen. We're good. We're, good. we're, we're just going to have to title this episode three Raphael's Horrors of Driving. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. So uh, you get back to Franklin and then uh, eventually get to. Channel 6. Um, what, what got you to Channel 6? Uh, my bad driving. No. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, you know, obviously, Channel 6 has been good to me. It's a better paying job, more opportunities, and uh, the ability to. I became the consumer reporter. Uh, I, I did the, the segment call, uh, called Call 6 for Help. Uh, I did that for about 12, 13 years. And I, I still do some of that still. And that's a that's a great gig. It's still a good gig. People call in with their problems, and I go out and I help uh, solve those problems. So it's just uh, it's a good way to use journalism, tell stories, right. meet people, uh, find out what's wrong, and then try to uh, correct that wrong. So um, I love that. So now are you are you mainly on air, like just doing the news stories, or kind of what's your role? Now, now? listen. You make it sound like I'm just a pretty boy, which, as you know, I'm ugly to begin with. And after all this makeup that I have on right now, just for you, I put on all this uh, makeup just to look pretty. You look uh, great. Uh, you look great. I mean, it, it's, it's the magic of television, right? I mean, I got mirrors. I got there's, there's smoke machines in this room. Um, I'm using someone else's body. Um, <laughs> no, so I, I, anchor, I anchor the morning news. OK, so I get up at uh, 3 30 in the morning, get ready for that, read my script. Uh, go on the air at 5 a.m. And then when I'm done at 7, I start reporting. So I start doing what I do, which is try to help people with their problems. So I still do the same thing. Just I'm also anchoring the morning news. So being up at 3.30, what is, uh, what is an appropriate bedtime for you then? Well, usually at 3.30, that's when my son Antonio comes home. So it's a good thing. I get to see him when he comes home. I go, hey, Antonio, good morning. Welcome home. And so it's good that I see one of my college kids you know, around the house. And then I get to work. So I know that he's home. And so everyone's met their curfew. And then I get to work. It's so if we're, if, if we're judging by that, then you haven't slept in about 18 or 19 years. <laughs> well, listen, that's getting personal. But with coffee and Mountain Dew, who needs sleep, right, guys? You know exactly. that. Exactly. Yes. Right. Now, it seems like the the morning gig, I've always, I've always thought it'd be good because I, I'm a morning person. I get up early, so getting up, you know, three thirty in the morning, that's that's not that's it's it's early, but it's once you get used to it, you know, your body adjusts and it's fine. And also, it's it seems a little bit more laid back. It's just you know you can kind of roll with it and and you know people are getting up you got to get a good positive start to the day is that kind of different than what you've done in the past so let's be honest 
at 3.30 in the morning, no one in America is up. Everyone is still asleep. Which or means if you, or if you are up, then you're like your son, and you're still right. up. Right, 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 which is, hey, what, shouldn't you be in bed? But yeah. look, at 3.30 in the morning, let's be clear. Before the pandemic, no traffic. So you were never going to get into an accident, right? And as you know, my driving was horrible. <laughs> That's right. great that for you. Right. Maybe they right. forced you to do this. <laughs> right, right. So think of how many lives have been saved. <laughs> also at 3.30 in the morning, all the bosses are asleep. Yeah. So they can't get in your way, right? So that's another plus to the shift. Then the other great part of the shift is you're usually done by 1 o'clock, which yeah. means you can do all the things that people want to do. Go to the bank, take care of business. But here's the part that sucks. Can I say suck on the show? Yeah. What, I, what sucks about the shift is Sunday night. Sunday nights you have to be in bed by 7. The, the Sunday scary right there. Well, and, and during the summertime where everybody's out mm -hmm. barbecuing at the pool, hanging out, you know, the sun is out at seven o'clock. You're like, yeah, I'm like grandpa. I'm going to go to bed. And so Sundays is, is the hardest part of the shift. But otherwise, it's a great shift. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I personally couldn't do it, but kudos to you for doing it. So, um, so well, they pay me. Well, yeah, 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 of yeah. course. Right. <laughs> you can so do it if you got paid. Yeah, <laughs> right. So let's be clear about any job. As long as they pay you well and they respect you and let you do your job, listen, if they want me to get up at, at noon or at two in the morning or Sundays at three, as long as you pay me. He good. said he said noon and Thomas's <laughs> ears perked up. He's like, wait really? a second, I get Wait, paid I, well and I get up at noon? Where do I sign I up that for free. that one? <laughs> well, so, Thomas, you could do this job. We have a shift that begins at three o'clock in the afternoon. So you can work from 3, 3 p.m. to midnight. So that, that could be your shift, right? That's great. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one right there. I hated that shift, by the way. It <laughs> yeah. was a terrible shift. So when I when I had my internship, I was at Wish TV as well. And I did, that was my shift was three to kind of whenever it ended. Because, you know, if right. there were athletic right. events or something, it would be, it could go until 1230 or 1. Now, luckily, I was the intern. So mm -hmm. at about 1215, they're like, yeah, you can go, go <laughs> home. But, yeah, it's, you know, by the time you get out, it's, 11:45 or 12 and I was in college uh, and so it's like I wouldn't get back to to my house until you know 12:30 or 1 so it's kind of like oh all right I guess I'll I'll just go to bed so yeah so uh big news out of uh college basketball yesterday all of the tournament will be played in Indiana yeah. what do you think about that listen i think um, not since we hosted the super bowl in indianapolis uh, this thing is huge because not only does Indianapolis get to enjoy having the teams here, but this is the Division Two and, and Division Three games we played out in Evansville and Fort Wayne. So really, every corner of our state will in some way be touched by this. And as you know, basketball is king in Indiana. And so we're really being asked to do what's in our DNA, which is to show the country and the world that we know how to play basketball. And so hopefully, uh, right, we want it, the, the games to be safe. We want the, the coaches and the players and their families, if they get to travel, we don't know those specific yet, specifics yet. But we want everyone to be safe because of the pandemic. But I think what an amazing opportunity to put ourselves uh, front and center to the world and say, hey, come on, we, we do this so well. So it's, it, it's going to be exciting. I look forward to covering just the spectacle of it all. I recall the Super Bowl. Super Bowl was amazing. Mm -hmm. That thing was I mean, lit. And so I look forward to seeing how this all transpires here in Indianapolis. It's going to be great. I think it's just a, a shame that it's not one of the games that are being played at Spurlock. Yeah, I think it should. They should play there. Maybe even the Wonder Five Center like, yeah. or the, the, the <laughs> whatever the gym is. I forget what it was called there at, uh, at Franklin College. But now with what I mean, is it going to be a difference for you if there are fans allowed or if there are no fans allowed? Is that going to be a difference, do you think? Or what do you think that's going to look like? Well, it'll be interesting. I think the, the NCAA will make the best decision for all right, the teams. And so I, I, I don't know. We just want everyone to be safe. Because what you don't want to happen, as you could imagine, if teams start dropping out or if people start getting sick, then that becomes a story. And so what we want to accomplish, I mean, I think what – with the NCAA, and we want these to be just safe games, right? That these young people come, they play their game, they do their thing, go home, win or lose, and that people can say, wow, 
they did that the right way. Sort of like the bubble was done down in Florida for the NBA. So I'm hoping that that's what happens with this. And I think that's the goal, right? The goal is to continue what is a, an amazing moment for all of us to watch, a great sporting spectacle, and make sure that it's safe. And so I hope that that's the, that is the goal, and hopefully we can get it done. And when I say we, I think we, we all sort of share pride in this, right? Because right. if we live in Indiana, we can say this is happening in our state. And so often the next, the biggest event that we really all get to share in as a community is the Indianapolis 500. And of course, last year that was also delayed because of the pandemic. I think we're all just trying to find that sense of normalcy. And I think March Madness for many of us allows us to say, wow, okay, things are somewhat coming back to normal under this new unnormal, unprecedented time. So I'm I, excited. I'm yeah. excited. I, I, I'm excited. And as yeah. you know, yeah. and as you guys know, or you may not know, I'm like five four, so I'm like an elf. So I could never play basketball. <laughs> I can't even shoot the ball, but I take great pride in those that go out there and really represent their communities and say, "Hey, we can do this thing. It's gonna be a great, great time." Yeah. So uh, I I know this is a broad question, but we always kind of have some fun answers when we get to this. So. Uh, before we wrap this up, I want to ask you what your craziest experience in nope. the field has ever been. Well, first of all, I'm not going to talk about that because, as you know, I, I'll tell you what. The, the greatest thing about being older than both of you combined, probably, and I, I don't show it because I have like 20 pounds of makeup on, <laughs> is that when I was a young guy, there was not, nothing called, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Twitter. And we didn't have this thing called Facebook or um, Snapchat. And because of that, most of the crazy junk that I did when I was 18, your age, Thomas, mm -hmm. um, there is no record of it. There may be like a dumb yearbook picture, right, that someone could say, aha, look at you and your nerdy glasses. But I would never share on a recorded machine <laughs> What about my crazy like, experience? Well, 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 not not your oh, not your personal experiences, but maybe something in the field. Uh, or is, is there nothing there either? Has there ever been a time where you were like scared when you were out reporting on uh, something? Dude, listen, I I've been scared a lot. You know, anytime you knock on someone's door and say, um, where's the money? Why are you a crook? Why did you steal Grandma Jones's um, car? Uh, you know, and any of those questions. I mean, I've had a woman, she was so pissed at me because her husband was embezzling uh, money out of a health fund, she started throwing things from the doorway. I mean, <laughs> I've had people threaten, you know, with guns. I covered a rally where these guys uh, let loose these pit bulls and luckily we were able to run back to the vehicle. So, you know, uh, so often, well, I'll say this, so often we try not to become part of the story because um, it's not about us. Right. And so, we don't always share those things because then it becomes a distraction, right? I don't want people to say, oh, I don't want to write a story and say, oh, look at me, I had a run. So what, it's part of the job. And so there are a lot of things that journalists do every single day that if we really shared those stories and you'd go, dude, what the hell? Why would you do that? And so it's just part of the gig, right? It's part of what I signed up to do. And so yeah, there's a lot of those where um, I'm just surprised that, um, you know, that that I did that, but, but it was for the good of the story. I'll also say, on a serious note, you know, this past summer we had those uh, massive demonstrations around the country. And just think about all those journalists yeah. that really and just trying to figure out what the hell is going on, trying to cover those serious stories, space masks and the tear gas and the cons and uh, all that stuff and, and a pandemic. You know, every time we go out, every time a teacher, listen, I mean, and let me just put this in perspective, guys. And I, and I thank you for the question. Journalists do a job, right? And, and we love our jobs, and our jobs are enshrined in the Constitution. But I have to tell you that I have this little sign here behind me, and I have this not because I'm trying to flatter anyone or try to get points, but these are the people that matter these days. The healthcare heroes, mm. uh, our teachers, anyone that currently is doing um, a job in this unprecedented time, and they're risking their health, and they're doing it for the good of the order, teachers, nurses, firefighters, police officers, these are folks that truly don't get paid enough uh, for the civic duty that they do. And so these are the folks that, I, that I'm concerned about. And so while I appreciate the, um, 
there are crazy things because people will do crazy things when a when a reporter says, "Hey, uh, show me the money," or "What are you doing?" People do go a little nutty. But I, I tend to focus more on the people like that's sitting next to you, Thomas, who really um, are kicking ass, right, and, and are doing it. Uh, I mean, they should be paid more money. Uh, those, those are the folks that we should really lift up and, and hear their stories, right? Because their stories are the ones that that really matter. So, you know. Rafael yeah. Sanchez, yeah. WRTV. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Ha have, having a teacher in your house and nurse in my house, we understand it. And like you said, we just have to give all of our gratitude to the people who are going yeah. out and doing that stuff all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. And, and please, when you see your local reporter or that works for the Daily Journal or works uh, for any of your local newspapers out there or your local TV station, I mean, you know, yeah, we're doing our thing, but we're not doing it per se. With the, with the risk that, like your teacher is right there. I think we, we owe the people that are really out there, that grocery worker that's freaking filling those, you know, those shelves and making sure that we have food to eat. That's what I'm talking about. That's the person who I really want to know about and, right. and, and tell their story because they're risking it all so that I could eat and feed my family. So, um, so I thank you for the question. I don't did I did I I deflect it. No, that, no, that 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 brought a that brought a far greater message than yeah. any what the question intended to. So no, I was glad you said that. Yeah, I but I, I did deflect. You, <laughs> you know, it, no, you out. answered it because you talked about the lady who was so mad at her husband that she threw stuff at yeah. you. Yeah, well, and the funny thing about that lady, I have to tell you, is shame on you because now I have you on tape. <laughs> Your husband was really a crook, so don't make me go back to your house and tell you that your husband's a crook. If I were you, like I always tell people, if you see me coming to your door and you don't know me, don't open the door, okay? Can, I, can we just be clear? If you see a Channel 6 vehicle roll up in your driveway, just lock the door. You just look out the window and see, just see, just look, see, who's no, this no, five foot no. four guy walking up my steps and like, yeah. uh oh, well, that's Raphael. Right. This ain't good. Yeah, I don't why, know why, why they'd answer. It's their this, fault. Why is this elf on the shelf at my door? <laughs> don't, don't even go by the window. Don't listen because I can record the window. So just don't even, don't talk to me. Especially if you know that you, your husband, your wife, your cousin is a crook. Dude, come on now. <laughs> It's not going to go down well, so it is what it is. Well, uh, Raphael, we appreciate your time. We know you're pretty busy, but um, we thank you for what you're doing, uh, bringing light to what's going on in the community. So uh, we just appreciate you stopping by and helping us. Hey, guys, I appreciate the time. Uh, have a great new year. Uh, good luck with this project. I, I, hope, I look forward to watching the other uh, podcasts, the other casts that you do. And uh, thank you for providing this platform so that people have an opportunity to uh, share a little bit and maybe encourage and maybe other folks that are listening or watching will say, hey, you know what, I could do that. Or better yet, let me, uh, let me give a shout out to someone who deserves it even better, like a teacher, a firefighter, or a nurse. So thank you, guys. I appreciate you both. And happy new year to you and your families. Yep, Raphael, you're the man. Thank Stay safe. Much. Episode three of The Pro Show.